Hello there, welcome back. This is uh, Franz Cantor and um, I am uh, doing another uh, drawing today. I'm doing another caricature and the subject of the caricature, kind of blown it then, didn't I? This is the subject of the caricature and it's Captain Kirk, of course, which is William Shatner. So uh, let's try to get into this as fast as we can without too much of a delay today hopefully um, right so now I've chosen to do um, the Captain Kirk um, era of uh, William Shatner not the not the uh, the modern uh, version of him where he's actually quite uh, um, changed a little bit his features are very ordered um, they're still quite ordered. I'll show you his pictures in a second. But basically, I've the the shape that I'm I'm trying to work with is this sort of like a I guess it's a, a boot or a sock Christmas stocking uh, type of a shape. And um, the reason why I've done that is because there's a lot of diverse movement in and that I'd like to get with him. Most of his shots. A fairly front on like like this one you know he's got like a like a tilt he's he looks underneath his brows for a lot of this a um, lot of these sort of expressions that he he, he um, favors for this uh, for this show and he's very amiable very sort of um, I guess uh, um, well-tempered um, he's kind of like the perfect captain. The whole show is kind of built on the premise of Captain Horatio Hornblow, which was a movie with um, Gregory Peck. So it was that sort of even-tempered uh, young captain who's a, a high achiever, sort of never really steps wrong, steps a foot wrong, and um, you know is uh, sort of a legendary um, ship's captain. So that's where Kirk comes from. That's where the, the, the story of Kirk comes from. So Shatner kind of lucked into this uh, role. He's really perfect for this, uh, this um, particular role. So I kind of like these uh, cheeky little um, shots that he has. They explain a lot of this uh, um, what we, how we, as we're going with the uh, caricature. So you can see from here, his features are really well proportioned. Um, he is a very, in every essence, a very handsome uh, man from that era, from the 1960s, 67, I think it was, uh, when this show started. And um, he's like a, a also because of his, you know, his good looks, he's like a romantic lead for the show as well. This is him in later years. This is him like uh, today. You could see that apart from you know his weight gain and. Uh, there is still very proportionate uh, features, except for perhaps the upper lip is, is, seems to be quite, there's a distance between the nose and the lip. Everything else seems to be quite, you know, in uh, proportion. There doesn't seem to be any um, structural damage over the years that, uh, that's too profound. Um, he really does look like these... Um, it's hard for me to explain what this expression is. It's sort of like a Simon Templar thing. You know, it's like that quizzical, uh, the, the eyebrows that sort of go up saying, and I cute type of thing. This is him in the early days, like when he first started in film, in um, I think film or TV, started in TV. So um, that's our subject. This is him with Tribbles. You know, he does favor this particular look you know it's a sort of a serious but also has a sense of humor this is an interesting thing this happens quite a lot in the show in this season um most particular with him but occasionally with aliens or you know female leads or something this is sort of this sh this um uh shuttering down of the light this sort of barn dooring of the of the light themselves to sort of create this uh focus area on the eyes. I've only ever seen this done outside of Star Trek. I've only ever seen this done in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein where they actually did that on Dracula 
when he was uh, hypnotizing a female uh, doctor or something in the in the show it's quite noticeable it's it's quite a dramatic and maybe melodramatic um, element this is his Khan moment of course which is obviously a, a meme Khan is really funny this is another caricature by uh, Jan van Oop um, but you can see that the, there's a there's even within this you know the destruction of the face there is a propensity for um, more or less um, regular um, proportions uh, with the exception of changing the shape of the head into a pear or an avocado <laughs> um, anyway uh, Shatner was born in 1931 he was a Canadian actor of course, he had uh, uh, Jewish upbringing, Jewish parents, and uh, moved to America and changed uh, or sort of uh, entered the, um, entered the, 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 the film fraternity and the television fraternity. So he's actually, if, when you see him, he's very, in other shows, you know, T.J. Booker obviously was one, um, Boston Legal, um, he was awesome in that. You know, but he's been in uh, things like um, oh, what would it, what is it? Um, not Night Gallery, the other one. Um, oh, Twilight Zone. So he had a very important, you know, there's something on the plane, uh, on the wing. So um, this is obviously more Drucker's um, Star Trek. I think Star Blech, he called it. Um, so even with you know cartoons and caricature them, it's quite even featured um, proportions. So that's something we have to play with and consider. So let's. I'm going to work from this one for detail, but probably this angle. Quite like the the lighting in these situations, you could see the sparkle that they've intentionally put into the eyes to give him a personality of sorts to make him more um, personable, more, uh, um, you know, interesting. Interesting and windswept. So uh, we've got this sort of a Christmas stocking effect of uh, a shape, which uh, I'm going to try to uh, adhere to. So I've done this little quick thumbnail just to work out a few of the problems. Um, we got this. I'm going to try to keep a little bit of movement in the face. And what else is there? There's obviously the lighting, which is uh, coming in from the uh, top right hand side. So any um, shadows would kind of fall on the bottom left hand side of the, uh, the picture of the character. OK, uh, there's also things like um, to get the, uh, because it's so proportionate, it's going to be sort of a, a, a really interesting juggling match of um, keeping things in some form of relative um, um, size and scale. But basically, we're going to try and create a dialogue between these elements here of the eyes the nose and the mouth okay so this area here on on a head is a face obviously but it's more exactly these number of features I like to think of as a in this T formation this T zone I like to think of it more of a mask like a Mexican style mask where you get all of these features together in one piece so each one of these are important if you're looking at uh, some illustrators talk about the mask zone as a, as a, a, a way of um, uh, creating a likeness so that you know most of the expression and the the recognition factor I guess comes from the from the eyes but there is a there is a dialogue that goes on between these elements on the face so that's what we have to sort of consider there's another thing too there's a certain amount of movement in the uh, face itself and a rotation so if you look back at the skull here the, the most of the shots of Kirk are like front on but slightly tilted um, 
we're going to um, do that, but we're also going to rotate a little bit because I like to have this sort of um, uh, three-quarter view as much as I can of characters, if I can. Uh, some sometimes it's not uh, possible, or you know, the, there is a relative uh, um, uh, freedom, I guess, in in picking the subject. Pick your fights. <laughs> That's what I mean. Pick your fights. So. I've tried to uh, capture the a lot of this. I like this sort of movement and things on here. I've tried to get that into the uh, rough pencil, which I've kind of started on the toned paper. So why are we doing drawings on toned paper? The reason is um, because I like it. No, the reason is because um, these, uh, these this method of drawing, and it's still drawing, is employing pretty much seven elements of art. So you've got line and shape and um, uh, uh, what else? Um, tone and texture and um, space and color also with the uh, with the brown uh, pencil. So it kind of imitates, it sort of uh, alludes to a flesh and blood sort of um, toning of uh, color tinging, right? So it comes from uh, classical painting and even before that in um, cave paintings in Europe, you could see mammoth drawings and, and um, saber-toothed tigers and things, horses, the Eohippus <laughs> on, uh, on cave walls. And they used uh, ochre and chalks and clays and uh, charcoal. Charcoal was one of the first uh, drawing implements. So this is kind of derived from, from that with a more modern take. Um, what else is there? I think that's it. We should s sort of get involved now, get moving. The type of pencils that I'm using are a couple of hard and soft versions of uh, colors. This is a terracotta Prismacolor and a, uh, a it's a comparable Indian red version of uh, polychromos. Polychromos a little bit harder. This is a Prismacolor. Prismacolors are soft, so be careful sharpening these. I usually use a battery-operated pencil sharpener for those because they're quite soft and they tend to break. All right, so let's try to press on and see what we can do. I'm going to try to keep the reference material uh, close to the um, closest as close as practical practicably um, to the drawing itself so I'm just going to articulate some of these details and shapes that I get here and I'm going to um, just try to within the shape that I've got I'm trying to get some some relevance some um, likeness so um i was uh like everybody growing up in that era i was very interested in science fiction and one of the first uh, shows that i'd seen was doctor who and uh, secondly would be probably lost in space and then third would be obviously star trek star trek was all over the magazines at the time, I could get uh, posters of um, Mr. Spock, who was the most famous uh, uh, actor from Star Trek. I, I think you, you can't really argue that. It's, I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's obvious that he would be the star of the show. Um, but, you know, Captain Kirk was no slouch. He, he had... Um, he had the acting chops, so he was a very, um, very cool captain. Um, never really got into Picard, but uh, you know he was very enjoyable to watch. I've seen all the movies, of course, of uh, Star Trek, so I know that uh, you know he's a incredible actor, great actor. And does a brilliant job but I think for a lot of people this era of Star Trek's uh, Star Trek holds a special um, 
place in their hearts and thankfully you can binge watch over and over and over again if you want to it quite they've got quite a lot of um i think it's about four seasons so there's a lot to watch and you know there is definitely they have a big budget so even you know 40 years later 40 odd years later it's like it's uh, well worth um you could see the value and of course you got the great combination of the great music lost in space had fantastic music too it plays a big part in in i guess whether a series is going to make it long term it's a lot i mean there are a lot of things other than the music but you know we like the music yes we do so um yeah growing up of course everybody had this uh, fascination for star trek and um it's very un it was an unusual um very it, they had some shows back then in the 60s where they really put money into and they shot on film and you know it was really a classy class act it's a very um very high quality the televisions at the time couldn't really accommodate that level of of quality color and you know density and things but when you see it on a digital uh tv you know the shows from that era um makes a big difference so um let's try to get some detail in the hair he has um this is a sort of a hair that i remember obviously with with time you know his hair has sort of changed i think he wears pieces and you know implants and all kinds of things so his hair's changed quite a lot but this is the sort of hair that i remember it was a very sort of a neat um 50s brushback So I was thinking when I was um, researching this, you know, what's my favorite? Do I have a favorite show, episode of uh, Star Trek? I guess the, the, I mean, I have favor favorites in terms of um, the stories for sure. You know, some of them were really, really cool stories. And some of them were for just clever. Um, I thought the Tribbles story was was really was really cool it was it wasn't uh it was funny klingon's worst nightmares um yeah so you know it every time i kind of every time i watch the series again and i do you know quite often like at least once every year i will see the whole series again and um i i love the different uh episodes and all of the different characters and things it just not just the, the crew but the the aliens and you know the 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 actors that they they get to to play these um sometimes quite laughable um alien um types but you know it's um they do it really well uh david cassidy's dad was in one and it was like uh, he, he he has a tendency to over overdo <laughs> the acting but um works really well you know it's just that that personality that shines through in the end i think the quality of the uh of the performance of the performer the quality of the performer okay sorry about that yeah no 
Cookie. All right, so uh, <coughs> piercing. So some lovely shadows, um, which I'm trying to be aware of and uh, and capture if I can a little bit, as much as I can. I'm I'm simplifying a lot of things too, like the nose, obviously. No one, no one has a ball like that for a nose. I'm, I'm trying to um, make the job a little bit more fun. You know, everything is sort of, all these shapes are like um, textbook perfection, really. They're perfect mouth, perfect eyes, perfect jaw, perfect this, perfect that. So as a caricature, that presents a little bit of an issue, really, doesn't it? Because there's nothing to pick on, really. So you're left with the the um, issue of finding something to pick on, pick a fight with something. You're looking for an excuse. And I always find um, an opportunity will uh, present itself when you think of, uh, you know, shapes uh think of shapes look for shapes and you know something that would uh, uh, seemingly be very normal and average like you know like someone has an oval head so you draw an oval from a different angle uh it can present there could be features that that uh, pop out in your imagination um that tell a diff slightly different story, you know, and that's worth investigating with a pencil. So this is part of the the magic, I guess, of the of process. You you don't know how things will go. You, I don't even know if I'm going to get a likeness or enough of a likeness. I might get a likeness, but maybe not enough. So you know, these are things that um, don't worry you. They shouldn't worry you because at the end of the day. This is a, it's not a democracy. This is for me. I'm enjoying this process. Ha ha. So there you go. Some great uh, shadows here. Try to get some. Try to be as uh, referencing them as much as I can. So some really nice things, you know, as I explained to you before, with the light source, it's giving me the ability to cut in with some quite uh, dramatic and beautifully articulate shadows. So the shadows for the shadows tell a story of form. Okay, so the more um, uh, details, the more variance in shape in the shadows, the more interesting that uh, that uh, becomes. So there's a lot of, there's still a lot happening here. I don't know whether I should give him, I'll, I'll try to knock that back a bit. I get the feeling there is something there, but I think um, err on the side of, uh, of, um, err on the side of, what was I gonna say? Err on the side of uh, caution and, uh, Resist the temptation to do a cleft in the the chin because uh, you know it might be inappropriate. I should check whether there <laughs> there is in other shots whether it becomes a thing whether it's a thing. I might be exa I might be you know um, exaggerating something that that just isn't there. So not right, not appropriate at all. So it's nice thinking about uh, forms, and um, you know, you, you you tackle proportions, different different things, elements in the in the drawing that has that can sort of give you more um, believability, more truth, I guess. Now the logo, I better have a look at the logo. I can't remember. There's a star in there, but I don't know the. Can't remember the exact. Um, Positions. Oh, that's dark there. That's all right. That'll do. It's fine. 
signature. So I'm kind of doing this um, to entertain myself, obviously. It's a fun exercise. I don't get much, I don't get a chance to do, you know, caricatures of people that I love. And that's a problem. Um, you know, I, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I love drawing people, but occasionally it'd be nice if someone said, draw Mr. Spock. Oh, okay. So, you know, drawing something that's precious to you from your childhood, this is, um, it's what makes me, it makes me happy to do this. I like this. And God knows we need to feel happy today, you know. All the news, bad news that's happening around the place, around the world. Some tough times we're going through. It's our own trek in many ways. So, um, let's try to, ooh, there is, uh, there's a little bit of cheek. Give him a bit of cheek, why not? So there's a lovely uh, expression that's being, it's got a quite, he has a small nose, but it has a lot of muscle. Um, and it's creating this thing. Let me show you about the forces that's happening here. On the face, over the skull, so the skull itself has a lot of uh, important features which are relevant to talk about. Obviously the, the, the orbits, the eye sockets. This area here which is structurally connected to a, a sinew, a piece of um, soft bone, uh, which gives the nose a length and shape. Um, this is quite uh, visible close to the skin. So are cheekbones normally. You might just actually refer to those in the drawing as well, even though you can't see them in the picture. Um, you know, it's, it's good to sort of refer to them in some small way. It gives the drawing a little bit more um, truthfulness, I suppose, or feeling of truthfulness. Now, the face itself is covered with this mass of tissues, and these are all sinews and muscles and things. So it's quite an articulate machine, really in expression and that's what it is it's not just for, for uh, shuttering down light or eating or anything or making noise it's for expressions micro expressions so these muscles get a lot of use depending on your career choices or your personality right it also gets a, a lot of use from thoughts and and feelings that play uh, a great uh, deal of the time across your face so if you're angry all the time, they'll show in wrinkles after, after a fashion. If you're happy all the time, etc. You know, if your business in your business or your personality allows you to speak a lot, right? Then you'll del deliver. You'll actually exercise muscles that will take on definite shapes. Uh, the same thing for thinking a lot, right? So lack of speaking would also uh, influence the shape of lines and uh, muscles and things on the face. So having said that, what do we find here? All right, we've got a series of a very, we have a very muscular face um, overall, very muscular face. And um, just refer to some cheekbones a little bit there. So there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of activity centered around the, the the middle part, which is the nose. So if you think about the nose as this sort of shape here in our drawing, there's um, forces that are acting on the features that are surrounding the nose, sort of pulling and um, pushing in and around. So there's this sort of effect, right? which uh, depending on the thoughts and activities, I suppose, that play on the face, they would form different muscles, exercise, some muscles that get bigger and other muscles less. Okay, so there's a lot of things like this sort of shape happening in Kirk's face, in uh, Shatner's face. So that's what's happening. There is a, a tendency to pull the eyes into the nose, and then the mouth is sort of creating this sort of seagull um, 
<laughs> effect, flying seagull effect as well. The flying seagulls like this. There you go. All right, so there's that. And that's created by an incredible amount of muscle. And in an actor, you generally find a lot of activity, a lot of muscle there because they're channeling their emotions and um, circumstance and trying to get believability into the role, etc., etc. So there's a lot of stuff happening there. All right, so there's a lot of muscle here, okay? And, you know, I would say that he is, in a, he is an actor. You can tell he's a speaking actor. He's not a silent movie actor. He doesn't have distinct, um, I call them ventriloquist dummy lines, which uh, I have on my face. Um, so that means that there, there's a, a lot of activity coming from this, a lot of energy. Okay, so let's try to, actually we're gonna use uh, work from this frontal picture for a second because I need to get a little bit more detail into the eyes. I don't want to sort of cover them with a shadow, which I want to do because of the, the dramatic lighting here. Um, I might just play with the, with the, uh, the shadow. He's got quite light eyes, it's sort of a hazel sort of a hazel color so gonna have a see what we can do someone was thinking about um, drawing Captain Kirk William Shatner today it was a bit sort of like mmm mmm you know it's like mmm nervous a little bit because he is a he is iconic and, you know, he is very uh, recognizable, number one. And also, I think he has quite a hard face to nail down, you know, because proportionately, he is quite um, perfect in terms of um, the features on his, on his face go back to this one that's the picture that I'm working from is a little bit blurry that's why I'm having a bit of a an issue but I think with the introduction of the correct amount of shadows from the eyelid so shadows you're looking for things that are um, Obviously, the, the eyeball is underneath the skin. So this sort of slit that represents the open eye, the open part of the eye, there, there is a, um, there's, there's an upper eyelid, which in this case, because his head is slightly lower, um, the sk skin is pushing down over the top. Consequently, there is a shadow that's falling over the eyeball itself and the iris. So there's that to compensate for. There's that sort of shading. Remember, we're, we're um, going to be drawing the shadows and referencing them quite strongly in this, uh, in this sketch. So what I'm doing here is helping the structure of the brown pencil just to give it a little bit more contrast, um, I think will help establishing the correct details and of course there's also in that era they wore a lot of makeup and eyeliner and things to make their features more um, readable um, so there's that going against me a little bit too because makeup tends to obscure the anatomy a little bit and we need to really think about the anatomy in order to get the um the correct structure um another little i guess it you could call it a trick perhaps um we're going to we're going to have a bit of an issue with this iris i think um Hmm. 
Yes, he has um, quite interesting features. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot riding on this. You know, it may not. It may. Uh, it may just be that uh, I can't achieve a, uh, a ready likeness from. Could be a few reasons. Occasionally, you make a faux pas. You sort of go down one way, and you should have gone a different direction. I'm. A, it's occurring to me though that there isn't quite. There isn't a lot of uh, shape to deform on Kirk's face. So having. Um, I mean shape out of its normal out of its normal positions normal proportions or whatever but we'll push ahead I love, I'm really liking the um, the shadows though I'm finding that really exciting very dramatic you know they have um, they, they such, did such a good job back then in TV you know, not to say they don't do it now, but, um, you know, it was striking back then. And um, we can we can appreciate it more now because of the quality of the, uh, the images on the TVs now, quality of t television. We didn't have that sort of color, full color back then. Um, when color first came out, it was still very formative. It wasn't a full color like cinema. It wasn't a cinematic experience. All right, so there's an awful lot of muscles around this, and uh, I'm going to try to get them. So when you have somebody that's handsome like this, they have features, but the features are very well proportioned to each other. So the dialogue between all of these elements, the nose and the eyes and the mouth, have a certain um, quantifying characteristic. So the more you start to play with them, the less the relationship uh, is uh, apparent, so it's kind of um, give and take. It's you have to sort of tread a little bit uh, lightly, I guess. Is uh, the sage advice here? So be careful. Don't overdo it. I think. Um, but it's, you know, some air, some things are quite, I think, safe, and that's the uh, the general um, the general air, the general elements. You know, sh um, there is a certain similarity between the noses and lips and eyes and things, according to anatomy. So, you know, there there is a little bit of that, a little bit of flexibility, I think. Okay. All right, we're getting into very handsome, um, handsome features. So he was a good guy. He was a good uh, face to look look at for sure. You know. Um, So very, uh, very handsome. You know, it's such a, um, I mean, people caricature his voice, obviously, Jim Carrey and that, his acting. So I guess he has a, a certain um, style, uh, stylized um performance um, 
But, you know, given the subject, I think you have to sort of stand out as much as you can because it's very easy to be overwhelmed by the subject matter. You know, so I think the um, I think it's a valid valid decision to stylize you to you know perform in a sort of a stylistic way. I think it makes sense. So look at the very um, I love this lighting, very dramatic. It's good. It's making me feel a little bit more confident I think hmm so apart from any technical um, issues which I might find here I'm um, let's get into something that might be a little bit more less frustrating and scary than the, than the lightness We'll get into drawing the hair. Of course, pencil is great for drawing hair because um, the strokes of the pencil, the pen kind of approximate the hair uh, strokes, the hair grow, um, strands in many ways. A good thing to think about though when you're drawing hair is to consider it as sort of in bunches rather than individuals. So that gives you sort of a, a, a way of creating hair that has um, group characteristics, you know, so patterns rather than um, haphazard uh, randomness, unless the hair is random or needs to be, and then, you know, you would go crazy. But generally, I think hair should be sort of put into sort of ribbons or groups, bunches, plates, not plates, um, yeah, plates like ribbons. Yeah. Typical of the era, you've got a, a very 50s haircut with um, long sideburns, which are, in this case are very spiky. There's also a little bit of makeup here too, so I'm, I'm having a bit of a bit of a hassle finding the actual true hairline. Okay. So I hope you guys are. Uh, enjoying the uh, well you can't really enjoy a lockdown but you know like uh, I guess take stock of your life and your choices and your career or whatever think about things you know I'm just trying to I guess reestablish my my uh, love of the game my Im interest in I guess in drawing and there's a lot at stake with um, I guess you know in drawing in general there's you, you want to be able to to create something that's on mark all the time that uh, is 
um, that looks like the subject or communicates it effectively in some way. But, you know, that's that can sometimes be a lot of pressure on people. So it's important, I think, to keep everything relative in terms of uh, your expectations and, you know, not go overboard with... Um, don't turn something that's supposed to be you know, enjoyable into something not enjoyable. Right, so I've got a fit of, I think I've got a, an idea that, uh, you know, there's a certain style that this show had that I'm, I'm trying to capture, I guess. And I'm going to try when I get. I'm going to go into the into the white pencil in a minute. So you know the likeness could be. Um, uh, it could be achieved a bit better with more uh, details, light and dark details. So I've obviously accommodated the brown pencil, which is giving it you know more form. And I'm going to complement that a little bit with the white pencil and bump up the contrast a little bit between just to help some of the elements so you've got you know the ability to I'll fix that up you've got the ability to create things that uh, pop and uh, make the contrasting um, a, a, like a nice contrasting arrangement of uh, elements so it's a nice range of possibilities. Let's help the dark, help the shadows out a little bit here and there. As I said, it's beautiful. I'm going to try to match those, um, those shadows if I can. Um, they're very, very nice. You know, that's the thing about Star Trek. It had that quality, you know. Um, which, uh, I mean, look, granted, a lot of shows had, like, Wild Wild West or something, or, you know, um, Man from Uncle, you know, you can go on and on and on. They all had great color and, uh, and, and density, um, especially now when you can actually appreciate that on, on digital, you know, or DVD or whatever. But... Um, this show had an extraordinary amount of quality pumped into it. And that's what I think made it last longer than, um, than it would have probably normally. Um, it just looked a thousand percent. Roddenberry just poured everything into it you know and believed in it and made everyone believe and the stories with a, a couple of you know exceptions probably uh, but the stories were really really top-notch so you know I mean this is from somebody who obviously grew up with lost in space and you know, and I love this, the first season of Lost in Space because the, the stories are very are much more much more serious. And I don't the black and white sort of helped uh, establish that, that dramatic um, element which uh, it was needed. It, it, it was definitely needed in, in that show. Uh, this show didn't have black and white, it had uh, color. So the, you know, the quality of that color was important. They had some beautiful sets, you know, and beautiful space sets where you could see the, the Enterprise um, circling, you know, planets and you get a real appreciation for the variety of planet systems and, you know, more than any other show or movie, I think. Um, it's just the sheer number of, of, of different life forms and 
you know, uh, obviously kept the the, uh, the the writers employed and on their toes and on their game. You know, doing a great job. I think you know people love uh, Star Trek, and in many ways, Star Trek owes a lot to. Um, sorry, uh, Star Wars, and in many ways, Star Wars owes a lot to Star Trek because it sort of was a groundbreaking experiment in a way. And um, you know, you obviously, if you had the imagination of say Doctor Who with this sort of budget you know, you'd, you'd be talking serious um, a serious show very very serious show and you know it's a force to be reckoned with so you know I guess there's a there's a what I'm saying is um, there's a price tag on having your like having a believable story believable imagination there's a sort of a price tag there's a there's definitely something in the um you know the cost factor like believability has a has a price okay so there's a lot to see there's a there's another muscle that's quite pronounced that's going over the top of the mouth, over the top of the teeth. The upper lip has a muscle. It's got a ring around it. See this? So that means it's well exercised. So somebody that is used to talking quite a lot and effective talking, like really you know, great projection and authority and things like that. Very muscular. See, that's the highlights pushing, it's pulling that lip. It's, you know, that's what the, the beauty of this process is, is to create a sculptural uh, dialogue between the different forms. So it's dealing with a three-dimensional um, narrative. So that light and shade tells story in some form. What is that story? Is it a story of form? Is it a story of detail? You know, what is the light revealing of the flesh? You know, flesh is a is a very, um, especially face. You know, it's a very uh, textural. Uh, and visceral uh, situation. All right, so uh, it's, it's a little bit thin up here, the hairs. So I think the, the highlight can travel up, up into the hairline a little bit. Uh, and then there's obviously this quite a profound, pronounced um, uh, shine on here which uh, the makeup lady missed <laughs> so uh, this is part of the um, finding the truth in the face finding the the um, you know elements that just feel right textually or or dramatically or whatever so Everything has some form, some story, some relative importance. So you see, getting a little bit better, you know, kind of, it's getting more. I think to a state where I can confidently say, yeah, I can see him. I can see him more than I did before. Or I should say, I could, I can see him more 
than I did before. It's like, uh, that's bad. If I wasn't drawing, I could concentrate on it more, but, you know. So the light's helping you describe the textures. It's also giving you an in inclination on, like an inkling to where this pulling and pushing is concerned in the, in the muscles of the face. There's a lot of things happening, acting on the muscles. Um, and that action, the creator uh, expressions, obviously, has a cause and effect. So the cause is, uh, you know, thoughts and passions and, you know, things that happen in the brain. And then they're picked up and communicated by the face. And depending on their strength or the the signal um, you know would depend uh, would would have an effect which is semi-permanent or permanent in terms of uh, uh, a visible effect on the face itself on the features So there's a bit of a highlight, side light, sorry, coming in on the left, um, which can kind of help give it a little bit of um, three-dimensional properties. But I'm going to tackle that with a different, um, a different implement. I'm going to look at the, um, the paint uh, pen in a moment, brush pen, see if I can up the ante a little bit on these um, decisions that I'm making here with the with a white pencil. All right, so let's try to get a bit of, um, I'm going to try to build up first some more contrast with a black pen in the eyes. I think it's maybe somewhat stylized. Just a little bit. That's good. Um, okay, so well, maybe before I do that, just help out. Yeah. So, um, what can I get over there? It's another pin. Move things around a little bit. Um, sorry, not that one. What I might get is a black brush pen. Um, gosh, I had one. Um, yeah, this, is a, this is a zig. So the ink is in the handle. And you sort of push it out to the to the bristles. So I'm just going to stylize some of this uh, shape here. So stylize the elements, the hair, a little bit and just thicken up some of the contours here and there to give it some more a little bit more strength just to boldly go whoops careful what did that pick up i don't know oh well um yeah so what I'm doing here is just helping out with the contrast a little bit, just to kick up the differences and the, between the different forms. So this brush pen has obviously a great sense of thick and thin properties, which I can used to articulate roundness and thickness obviously volume so it has a good uh, good 
good sense of um, I think appropriate um, contrasting elements that's quite nice all right so I'm going to try to bump up the contrast here in the hair just darkening some of these so you can't get absolute black with the pencil usually um, well you can but it's you know it can be a bit of a pain uh, it, you know it's easier with a brush to sort of compensate and give it a little bit of help so with the tone paper of course you are building a sculptural relationship between you know that that speaks about the forms the volumes missed it missed it by that much <laughs> okay here we go all right that'll do so what else can I do um, get more mischief happening here you know what before I do anything else let's once and for all have a look at the ah there it is okay so this is what I'm missing here this elongated star it's also this should be black too. that uh, outline and the interior should be white Mm-hmm. Let's fix that. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to share was, uh, what else can I do with this? Is um, Oh, here we go. It's a paint pin, a Posca, which is a... Uh, acrylic marker so it has a pump in the tip and the, in the end and you sort of push that and it pumps paint out to the bristles so I think once you wet the bristles it becomes more flexible and usable so this is really good because because it's got a brush it can get thick and thin you know which is nice So, again, just helping out the contrasting. Light and shade areas, which is good. Um, mm hmm. So looking at, uh, you know, creating stronger little accents here and there, highlight accents, which uh, might be helpful in creating a three-dimensional effect. Go back to the original photo. Be careful how much... Uh, light I put in I guess um, you'll know when it's um, too much you go oh it's wrecked no. so I'm putting in oh let's try to get something happening up there maybe a bit more so what else can I do here to get into mischief? Hmm.
Yeah, I'm not convinced 100%, but it has helped a little bit. It's certainly um, telling me how wonderful this light is, though. The lighting is really exceptional. Hmm. So, oh, try to went a bit crazy with the lights over there. Oh, maybe knock that back a bit. All right. So at, at the sort of uh, position where I think um, I might be destroying more than I'm fixing so might be a good way of um, stopping soon what did I do wrong what's wrong what's that can't quite see oh well if in doubt fill it in I guess um, Yes, actually, you know what? Let's try to get compensate with the the light on the bottom part of the lid there. Sometimes there's like a water or tear or something that uh, is catching the light a little bit down the, on the bottom inside the the lid or at the the very edge, the the verge between the lid and the eyeball. They could sort of catch a little bit. Um, might be a little bit much. Hmm. Okay. Not still not convinced. It's all right, but you know. I love this lighting though. The lighting is smash smashing. It's very nice. Let's try to get some drama in the sky. If I can. Is it safe to lean on this? Don't know. Actually, you know what? We'll do it with a pen. So these are uh, paint markers. I've got black and white paint markers. And they're pretty good because you can cut in quite effectively. So I'm just going to do, obviously, a black sky would be appropriate because of the space theme. Um, the paint markers dry pretty flat. So this is how I used to fill in illustrations when I was working for the newspaper. It's quite a dramatic uh, accent, I think. I tend not to go right up to the line of the drawing. Um, simply because if I did that, you'd be kind of filling in the the contours. So you'd lose a lot of the elements of uh, thick and thin that you're that you've tried to get with the brush. So just sort of shy of the lines a little bit there it's a really iconic uh, TV show this um, many respects you know set it established a set of rules for TV science fiction um, that I guess those rules are still evident today. You know, there's a certain expectation. Uh, like I also like, I love the, the Orville, which is like a homage in a way to Star Trek. So 
of certain familiar conventions, you know, the bridge, the medical bay, you know, a science officer. alien um, other crew members and a, like an imperative to seek out new life and other civilizations and things like that which is kind of ni nice um, trope in a way Interesting. He was certainly a slick gentleman, this guy, Shatner. I loved him in um, Outer Limits. It was a, uh, a, um, a show where he played an astronaut returning from, I think it's from Venus. And... Um, You know, the, he gave a really good performance, stellar performance. I mean, certainly that, you know, it's a Shatner performance, but within that genre, it worked really well. So, there you go. Uh, let's finish him off. Let's put the, the naming convention here. So, we go with the W and the I and the L and the I. William A T. Shatner. I can't think of anything else I want to do on this. It's kind of, uh, it's a really nice um, set of uh, <laughs> lighting exercises. Um, I kind of like the, the way that these have popped out, you know, the, um, the, the highlights kind of stylized in a way. I kind of, I kind of like that. So um, you can actually feel now, it feels muscular. It feels like, you know, what it should be, I think, texturally. I think I've got the right sort of drama in the expression. I don't know, what do you reckon? So I've taken some diabolical liberties, but overall, I think, um, I think he works quite nicely. It's, you can sense the muscles in the face. You can definitely sense the muscles. And even, you know, at the, at the, in the modern era, you know, he's, he's actually weathered quite well. Um, you know, even though he's got a bit of weight, there's still, you could see evidence of this muscular uh, effect on his features. You know, all the features are quite um, respectful of each other. They're quite regular and ordered. It's a very fit person here and a very fit face. See, so even in, you know, there's, even in the early, early days, he had a lot of uh, muscles there. So that's, that's very interesting. All right. Um, this is, uh, this is my version of uh, William Shatner. And um, this is Franz Cantor. And I will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.